Hello and welcome to an empty rack. I'm building a time of flight mass spectrometer and today I'm going to discuss the electronics used in that. Fundamentally this is the instrument I'm trying to build. The cool thing about this is that it uses two channel electron multipliers, both one as ion source and one as detector. So the basic setup is this this half is exactly as it is in any mass spectrometer, or in the vast majority of mass spectrometers. There's a channel tron set up to detect irons. In this particular instance, positive irons. So, we have a drift tube, also called a field-free drift tube, set to some negative voltage. Once the ions are in that, they'll basically just move gently along this way. And here comes the novel thing. Okay. As I say novel, this is quite an old idea, but it's quite easy, so I wanted to try it out. Um, we have a channel electron multiplier here with the anode removed. So this is just an open tube. And this is just set up with the bias that it's usually to create a bunch of electrons. And here we have a glass window, a UV transparent glass window. I have bought a quartz window for this occasion. And you'll have some light source outside, maybe just ambient light, maybe a small light source. This will just shine UV photons into the electron multiplier. It is also sensitive to UV photons, um, not as much as electrons, but it is. And so you'll get bunches of ions sh shooting out here. And remember, one particle impinging here will give a huge cluster out here. So you'll get bunches, like every some seconds at some random interval. You can adjust the light intensity of course to give the, uh, the counts per second you want. About a hundred would probably be nice. And then you can take that pulse out exactly as with any other uh, electron multiplier. or the, Well this is basically a, a homemade PMT I guess. And uh, the pulses will be positive because we have we are not taking the electrons from the uh, the anode, so we don't collect electrons, we actually lose electrons, so we get the opposite polarity pulse. That's a bit confusing, but I think that's how it is. We'll see when I build it. And then there's just a guiding ring um, that's grounded here, and a tungsten target plate. This is just a piece of tungsten foil arranged 45 degrees on the uh, impinging electrons. And in this volume, any gas molecules that will be hit, any residual gases, will be essentially iron, uh, essentially electron impact ionized, like in GC. And if there's any ions absorbed on the foil of the tungsten, they will also be ionized. So you can also use this for surface study as well as residual gas analysis. These ions will then be positive, they'll be stripped off some electrons. But these positively charged ions will then be attracted, they will be uh, attracted towards the negative charge of this drift tube I'm not completely sure what drift tube voltage to use, maybe a couple of hundred volts, I'm not sure. And they'll then drift gently into this and hit this detector. Now, we know the time they originated, right? Because each electron bunch has a timing start pulse. This pulse indicates that electrons has left this channel electron multiplier. And the detector out signal here is then a stop pulse, and that time differential is proportional to the mass of the ion. This is the principle of a time of flight mass spectrometer. And uh, this is so simple that how could it go wrong, right? As stated before, I wish this was my idea, but it isn't. Here's the article, it's from 1971, all the good stuff is. So basically we need to be able to time particles and measure the time between two pulses. And the way you do that in particle physics is like this. This is the basic principle. You have our two channel trons. I've omitted the bias supplies. We have preamplifiers. We then have two discriminators that sets a baseline for noise. And then basically we just get the start and the stop pulse into what's called a time to amplitude converter, which basically just as the name suggests, converts the time differential to a pulse height. And then we just use a normal multi-channel analyzer, as you would for gamma spectroscopy, to display this in a spectrum. Couldn't be simpler. 
Okay, so today I want to test this because I have almost all the gear for it now. And um, the test setup is going to look something like this. It's a bit more complicated. Basically, we are simulating two pulses by first having a pulser. This pulser is fairly slow. And then we have our fast timing preamplifier here, which will give a very fast pulse out. And this pulse is then sent to the start discriminator and through a variable delay to the end discriminator or the stop discriminator and then to the time to ambassador converter. Now, that delay let us simulate different times of flight and let us see if the electronics work at all. And then we have the, the MCA uh, doing the counting. So let's set this up. First of all, we have our preamplifiers. I'm using these Ortec fast timing preamplifiers. They are practically made especially for this. I think I've shown this module before. It's a Tenelec TC812 pulse generator, usually used for calibrating gamma spectrometers and stuff. And uh, it's basically just a mercury relay in a box with some added features. It's quite handy um, and it works quite well. I think it's 60s vintage. It's going to be much too slow though, that's why we need the, uh, to use the preamplifier. Next up is a timing discriminator, or a fast discriminator as it's called. Also 60s vintage, 68 to be precise. Um, surplus from Brookhaven National Air Laboratory. So this will provide our discrimination and uh, pulse rejection. And here we add a Canberra delay amplifier. This basically gives us five different uh, selectable delays that can be added together. A 250 nanoseconds, a 500 nanoseconds, two 1 microseconds and a 2 microsecond delay. You can also set the voltage ranges and do pulse polarity switching and such like that. These amplifiers are just, or these modules and delays are almost crucial to calibrate a lot of this time, uh, timed stuff. Also, if you have a, a big setup with a lot of cables and uh, you need your uh, a gate signal to arrive at the same time as a pulse signal, having these delays are completely critical. So uh, those are very well, uh, those are very good ideas to have. I'm going to add now a very strange module that is simultaneously a time to amplitude converter and a multi-channel analyzer. So uh, this module over here, the LeCroix LRS QVT 3001 multi-channel analyzer, has two cool features. The first is that it's a tiny multi-channel analyzer. It just outputs X and Y signals to an X, Y mode monitor or oscilloscope as a screen. It also has three modes. It has Q mode, where it has a built-in preamplifier, so you can basically just put a photomultiplier or a scintillation probe directly on it. It has a normal MCA mode, and then it has the time to amplitude conversion mode, where it's basically a, a t complete time of flight system. Okay, so that's all the NIM electronics we need. Also, we have a uh, an XY monitor for the multi-channel analyzer, and we have a digital oscilloscope. So first, let's make our signal source. So here we have our tenelec tail pulse generator, um, and we are going to connect that fairly directly to one of these uh, fast preamplifiers. These fast preamplifiers are terminated in 50 ohms, which is exactly what we want. So we don't need to do anything more than add a cable to that. By the way, I would say one of the most critical things about uh, doing like modular crate electronics in a rack like this is to have a drawer below the rack where you can have uh, parts and adapters and small cables and miscellaneous little things. Also, if you drop anything, it'll drop into that. So first of all, we can send our preamplifier directly to our oscilloscope just to check out what's coming out of it. Preamplifier I just connected to directly to a, a small lead acid battery. Um, it was just the easiest way of getting 12 volt, you know, remotely, and uh, it lasts a million years with a uh, like uh, two milliamps of what this draws, and uh, it's very noise free. And here we have a nice, almost symmetrical 250 millivolt narrow pulse out of the preamplifier. That's good. We can feed this to a discriminator. Okay, now let's put this preamplifier signal into the discriminator. By the way, another good tool for timing, short elongation BNC cables, because when you get to nanosecond timing, this is actually enough to see a difference. This is approximately, I would say, maybe two nanoseconds. 
good idea to keep cable lengths the same and it's a good idea to have a tool to do that. So these have an input and an output here. It also has the option to terminate or not. Uh, we can just put it to terminate, that's, that's fine I think. Um, now the output here is basically just bridging this out. It's, it's quite smart because then you have a, a, just a simple port where you can put your oscilloscope. And remember everything has to be terminated properly, so everything is terminated in these 50 ohm loads unless it has an internal termination like this, this does. Now let's take the output here. By the way, the controls on the discriminator here, you cannot set the discrimination threshold. It's fixed at around 100 millivolts. So now we can take a look. And here we see channel 1 is the preamplifier output and our pulser. And channel 2 is the discriminator output. We can set the output width. Oh, please update. Like that. And we can set it short like that. Notice the output is about 800 millivolts into 50 ohms. This is the hallmark of a NIM pulse. Now NIM fast logic has these, uh, this current based logic into uh, like 50 ohm termination and uh, it's a it's whatever current as a negative pulse that gives around 800 and something millivolts into a 50 ohm load. So this is a, an impulse and this is why and this is why we need this discriminator, because, let me just do this and this. I'm just doing this because then the update rate is better. I'm going to vary the input pulse now, and please note, you can see the output pulse doesn't change. It doesn't care about the pulse height, it just cares that it's above its threshold, which is something like uh, 50, 80, 100 millivolts. Now we add in the delay. Now when adding in the delay, it's as simple as just using the direct output here. So let's just add this into our delay. And this needs to be terminated. The input is down here. And we're just going to use this output here. And now we can take this terminator away. And now we can take the output of that into the other. Okay, and then we can take the output of that into our scope and then we should be able to see... Alright, so there we have the two pulses outputted from both discriminators. They look identical, but they are shifted slightly. The, uh, the delay is set to not shift them any. This is just the delay of the cables and the, the electronics. This is why it's very good to have a variable delay so you can match up signals. If this was if this pulse was going to trigger for this one or opposite, then this would not do. Um, now, we can add in delays. Here's 250 nanoseconds. This is one microsecond actually. This is 500. So yeah, now we have our signals and now we can feed them to our multi-channel analyzer. Okay. Please note that I've added in a, another preamplifier after the, uh, the delay because the delay kind of stretches the pulse very flat and uh, then it dips to below the threshold for the uh, for the discriminator and also gets very wide so uh, this will keep it a short nice pulse and also amplify it. So uh, basically it just has a start and stop input and then it generates all the gating itself and um, it has a display up that I'll show you later. Okay so let's decide that this cable is start and that this cable is stop. Okay, that should be it. Now we can uh, now we can clear the display, and we can start the count. There. It's difficult to see, but you can see the 250 nanosecond pin pile up. And now let's say 500. I'm just switching out the delay now. Look at that. We're actually measuring time of flight on the 1970s display with all the magic that goes with it. 750. Oh, a bit drifty. Not exactly what I would call linear, but I don't think that is the analyzer electronics. I think that is the specific delay lines that are not that precise. 
and that's one microsecond. So now we have our time of flight display. So in the paper I've been looking at, they claim to have a flight time of about two microseconds for math number 16, and uh, which will give this display, as it is right now, about a resolution of um, half that. Maybe this is, you can see this is uh, one microsecond, so maybe one and a half microseconds, I think. Um, one and a quarter, maybe. So that'll give us something like up until 10 mass units. Um, which is not which is not brilliant. Um, we would like to go to at least a hundred, so we need to slow this down somehow. The uh, the analyzer does have provision for slower ranges. Uh, you have to add some some timing resistors yourself and stuff. Anyway, that's all I had. Hope you found that interesting. Of course, I'll update you once I actually built the. Uh, the iron source on the detector. I think I'll test the iron source first, and then see if, uh, yeah, see if we can uh, get this to actually work. But uh, the electronic signal chain is is definitely good now. I like that. I'm happy. Hope you are too.